Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Shallowford Presbyterian Church. We're delighted that you have decided to be with us today. If you will notice in your bulletin, there are announcements to pay attention to, so I encourage you to read those and our newsletter. I also want to take this opportunity to tell you that beginning September 1st, I will be the transitional pastor at Elkin Presbyterian Church for six months or so. So I will not be with you um, for that period of time, but I will be thinking about you and you'll see me around. And now let us join together in our prayer of the day. Let us pray. Who is invited to worship God? All who seek the blessings of the Spirit, all who have gifts to offer for God's service, all who are thankful for our redemption, all who live in hope of God's reign on earth. Who is invited to worship God? Children of God, let us worship. See 
Just go to God. Go to Him in secret. Loving God, you know us backwards and forward, inside and out. You created us in your image and gave us a beautiful, rich, and fruitful world to take care of. You even sent us your only son to teach us how to serve you. Only three things were asked of us, to love you, to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. Help us to love as you want us to love. Help us to take care of this beautiful earth and all the creatures on it. May we ever be the people you created us to be. Amen. Prayer for Illumination Your word, dear Lord, teaches us the way you want us to live. At times, the stories are funny and sweet. Sometimes they are ugly and hard to listen to. Today, we have one of those stories. Help us to hear your voice through the ugly parts and learn what true beauty is in your eyes. Open our hearts, minds, and souls to your word that we might understand. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak.
Our gospel reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. Hear these words of God. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? And she replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want you for a minute to imagine that you're a teenager, and it is prom day. You've got the dress, and you've got the tux. Your mom reminded you to get the flowers, and everything is going good. That boy that you have been looking at all year long asked you out, and then that girl that you sat beside and you were too shy to talk to, you finally said, will you go with me to the prom? And she said, yes. So you get out of bed, and oh, it's such a beautiful day. And you go in the bathroom, you're going to wash your face and brush your teeth, and there it is. Not a spot, not a bump, a zit. I mean, you know, those big red ones that takes up your forehead or your nose or your chin. Oh, what an ugly thing. And what can you do? Nothing. There is no amount of makeup or anything you can do that can hide that zit. You're stuck with it. Well, when, when I went through puberty, my sister and I were 13 months apart, and she's about this high and a, a little redhead, and she's a flirt. Now, if she thought a door was cute, she'd probably flirt with the door. And we went to this dermatologist, and he was a young fellow, so of course Pam proceeded to flirt with him throughout the whole procedure. And he was a good sport about it. And when he got through, he said, okay, Pam, you can go wash up in the bathroom. Well, when she got there, what she saw was a face full of blood where he had done all of her pimples. And she was so embarrassed that she never flirted with that guy again. So the reason I tell you this is because this is an ugly story. There's no other way about it. It is an ugly, ugly story. It's about the abuse of beauty, of power, and privilege that results 
Now, I'm going to say up front that many people are affronted by the word privilege. And I understand this because I remember back a few years ago when the, the key word going around was family values. And I used to think, and I would always usually ask, whose family and whose values? Nobody ever had an answer for me. So I understand if you have problems with a word. I mean, when I heard family values, it's like somebody took sandpaper and ground it on my skin. And privilege is that word for a lot of people. But hang with me, because I'm going to try to explain it in the context in which it's being used in these days and in these times. Now, I want to give you the story up to this point. This is a very dysfunctional family. Well, I think most families are dysfunctional, but this family gives the word a whole nother meaning. First of all, you have Herod the Great. He's the one that the Magi came to and asked for directions to where Jesus was. Now, the Romans had given Herod a lot of territory, and they had even named him King of the Jews. That was Herod, one of Herod's titles, and he wasn't about to give that title up. And so he got his advisors after he sent the Magi off and said, look, there's a baby, there's a little child around here somewhere that's, that wants to take over my title, and that's not going to happen. So I just want them all killed. So he had all the little babies and all the little children under two years old put to death. Nice guy. He had 10 wives and several children, but some didn't survive as he had them put to death if they upset him. Well, Herod the Great died, and he left three sons. Julius Caesar had to step in because the sons were bickering so much over Herod the Great's territory that they couldn't figure out who was going to do what. So Julius Caesar separated it into three parts. Herod Antipas, who is the Herod that we know with Jesus, is the one that got Galilee to rule over. Now, he was known to be prone to violence at times. He was not a very nice person. Um, he had made a marriage, a political marriage, that brought him a lot of wealth and a lot of power and a lot of prestige. But then he saw his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and immediately fell in love with her. So he takes his political wife and he sends her home to daddy, which that's another story, the controversy that caused. And somehow he got Philip to divorce Herodias and he married her. Now, if Philip had died, it would have been fine for for. Herod Antipas to marry Herodias, because that was one of the things in the Jewish culture. But his brother was well and alive, and John the Baptist, he was not one to mince words. So every chance he got, whenever he saw Herod, or whenever he saw Herodias, he would say, you are sinners. You're committing adultery. You can't do this. You aren't really married to her. Needless to say, Herodias didn't like this very much. So she wanted to put John to death, but Herod didn't. Herod, there was something about John that called to Herod. So Herod had John arrested and put in prison, in effect, to protect him from his wife Herodias. He liked to go and talk to John and listen to him, and it says even though he didn't understand what he was saying, he still liked to listen to him. So Herodias was very clever. She decided just to bide her time and to see what would happen. Now, she had a daughter by her first marriage. Her name was Salome. In our scripture reading today, it calls her Herodias, but she was really Salome. And we don't know how old this girl, girl was, but she is called a girl, so probably a teenager is what we're thinking. 
Now, Herod decided to throw himself a great big birthday party. He invited everybody he could think of. Oh, was he going to have a wonderful time. And so Herodias came to him and said, Darling, our sweet little Salome has been practicing her dancing, and she would like to come out and dance for your guests. Do you think you would let her do this? Well, of course, darling, send the little girl on. Now, I don't know a lot about the dances of that time period. I know that there was a dance of the veils, but I think that was kind of something to do with wedding ceremonies. But I can guarantee you that she, it was not tap, ballet, or jazz that Salome performed before Herod and his guests. It's kind of like when, when we were teenagers and rock and roll came around and our parents thought that we were purely evil because of the dances that we did. You ought to go to clubs today and see what kind of dancing is going on. I think it was something like what Salome was doing. But anyway, Salome did her dance and Herod was so turned on by this sexually explicit dance that Salome did, that he offered her anything she wanted. He could wealth, power. Can you imagine you're a teenager and somebody tells you you can have everything you want? Well, let's see, there's that palace, a chariot, that slave, oh, the jewelry. So she says, well, can I ask mama? He says, sure, go ahead. Now, I don't know what kind of relationship this girl had with her mother, but it doesn't sound like it was a very healthy relationship. She goes to her mother and she says, Mom, what should I ask for? He's going to give me anything, even have his kingdom. And Herodias saw her opportunity. She said, you ask for the head of John the Baptist. Salome went back to Herod, and she said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Why did she ask for that? Doesn't that sound revolting coming from the lips of a young girl? I told you this was an ugly story. I can't think of anything uglier than a beautiful young girl who either through malice or love of her mother or whatever, asking for such a gruesome gift. Can you see the picture? I certainly don't want to imagine what it looked like, but I have to look. We have to see what hatred and malice and power can accomplish. All too often we don't look. And we refuse to see the ugly things in life that are happening all around us. I grew up here in two warnings. Beauty is only skin deep and pretty is as pretty does. And what this means is it's okay to be beautiful. I think my grandchildren are the most beautiful children in the world. But the, what the story is warning us about, what these sayings are warning us about, is using beauty for evil purposes. And asking for a man's head on a platter shows that Salome and Herodias' beauty was only skin deep, and that beauty was overcome by sin. Now, this Bible lesson is not only about the abuse of beauty, but it's also about the abuse of power. It's about the ways in which we don't love God or put God first. It's about not loving our neighbor. And I would argue that it's even about not loving ourselves, but instead selling out to sin. Okay. Now, I'm going to use that word I warned you about, privilege. And if I had time and we had a big group of people like a presbytery meeting with lots of ethnicities, we would go out in the parking lot and in about 10 minutes, I could show you what the word privilege in today's context, context really means. But instead, I'll give you a couple of examples. My mother wasn't rich growing up. 
She was one of 13 children, and they lived on a, a working tobacco farm. She was one of the older kids, so she worked on the, on the farm. She didn't know how to cook when she married my daddy. He had to teach her how to cook. She'd never seen the beach. She didn't know much about um, children. I have a scar from some chicken pox where she thought I'd gotten bug bit at the beach. And she didn't, it was about two years before she got married that they actually got indoor plumbing. My cousins and I loved to go to the outhouse and try to figure out how it worked without any water out there. But one of my earliest childhood memories is going with my mom to see this very, very old woman. My grandma, when she would have children or during tobacco priming season, would have some help come into the house. It was a busy time after priming tobacco all day. The men would come in and they would eat a full meal. The women would clean it up and then the women and children would sit down and eat a full meal and the women would clean it up again. So here's this little old woman so small, tucked in her blanket, lying on a pallet on the floor, and mom is giving her her medicine. And then, as I was walking around and looking at everything, I looked down at my feet, and I looked at the old woman in her pallet, and I looked at my mama's knees. We were all standing on red dirt. There wasn't a floor in the house. It was only dirt. How many of you grew up with a dirt floor in your home? If you didn't, you're privileged. Another example, in our coastal counties, it's hard to get federal or state assistance because according to the numbers, these are very wealthy counties. However, all the wealth is situated on the coast. If you go five or 10 miles away from the ocean, you can find people today who do not have running water in their homes, who do not have electricity or indoor plumbing. And I would dare say that there's places here in Forsyth County where you can find that very same thing. There are so many parts to this story that I can't possibly help you to understand everything. But if you go home this week and think about the sinful way beauty was used in the case of John the Baptist, then good. If you spend this next week writing about all the things you have that you think are necessities and understand that not everyone in this community, county, state might not have these same necessities, then you are on your way to not only better understanding privilege, but better understanding and loving your neighbor. And if you find yourself wanting to see changes made, speaking up against systemic poverty, you might find yourself very frustrated because there are very few people who will listen. This is an ugly story indeed. There's no love of God or neighbor. The love of self is based on human values. I hope you can see and understand the difference. For if you can, then you can understand why Jesus kept telling us to love God, love our neighbor, and love ourselves over and over and over, not by human values, but by heavenly values. Then maybe someday, atrocities like a head on a platter or a young child who was killed in a drive-by shooting, or name-calling, or bullying, or any of the ways we misuse our power will slowly stop happening. Until that day, you and I and every one of us can make a difference in this world, 
this community, this congregation. So go on. Do it because that's all that Jesus asked you to do. Be the church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for God will speak peace to the people, to the faithful, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Surely God's salvation is at hand for those who adorn God, that God's glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give us what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before God and will make a path for God's steps. And now let us pray for our people. Gracious and loving God, in the past few weeks, we have had so many who have experienced loss of loved ones. We ask you to hold each and every one of them in your loving arms. May they continue to feel your presence and to know that you have not left them alone. Be with them through their grief and be a part of the healing process. 
We pray also for those who are struggling with illness and disease and other things that are affecting their lives. Be a healing presence to them as well, dear Lord. We don't know all that is going on with everyone, but we put them all in your hands. We lift them up to you, knowing that you are good and gracious and that you love us all and that you will be with us and you will never forsake us. We ask all of this in your son's holy name. Amen. And now we are bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to this day to remember your tithes and your offerings. You're able to give online, and you also can mail in your offerings. So we encourage you to do that. Hear now our prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Gracious God, thank you for all the wonderful gifts that this congregation has been entrusted with. We ask that you would show us the way in which you would have us to use these gifts, that it would be according to your will, that it will help those who need help, and that you will be with all of us and teach us how to give and how to use all the many things that you have blessed us with. Thank you, Lord. Amen. My charge to you today is very simple. It is written on our sign. Be the church. Protect the environment. Care for the poor. Forgive often. Reject racism. Fight for the powerless. Share earthly and spiritual resources and embrace diversity Love God and enjoy this life. Go with God and live a life of being the church. Amen.